Welcome, everybody. This is Greg Peterson coming to you from the urban farm in the heart of Phoenix, Arizona. Today, we're presenting Seed Saving Hacked, Why Seeds Matter, Why Saving Them is Easy, and How You Can Save Your Own. I'm excited that you're here today, and I'm joined by Bill McDorman, the executive director and co-founder of Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. They can be found at RockyMountainSeed.org. He founded SeedSave.org and Seed School. Bill has been teaching seed saving for decades and is dedicated to educating communities about the value of seed saving and growing local seeds as the foundation of our local food system. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Greg. I'm honored to be here and excited. And welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, I really believe this is the most important thing that we could be doing. Seed saving captured me in 1979. I was simply looking for seeds for my own garden and uh, uncovered a power and a magic and a potential. Well, that still has me going. I thought maybe I was going to be involved in a three- or four-year project, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in the webinar. but, But I'm still here, and I'm still doing it, and I'm really happy that you're here with me. So... So let's get started. That's me standing there on this opening slide next to a thresher on an old homestead near Conrad, Montana, where I was last summer traveling for the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance trying to meet as many seed savers as we could. And the corn that you see, which will be on our index pages, is glass gem corn. It's one of the only vegetables to have its own Facebook page. I believe it has more likes than any other vegetable. Last time I looked was over 10,000, so you can go there and look at all sorts of pretty pictures. No, that is not genetically modified. No, the picture is not modified. That's just an actual picture of corn that grew in Wayne Marshall's field in uh, Buell, Idaho, that we harvested during a seed school a couple of years ago. So let's get going. I try not to um, have anything negative, if I can help it, in my lectures these days. There's enough of that out there. Uh, This is a wonderful image done by an artist in Canada who gave us permission to use this for our um, educational work. And uh, he did this in response to what he was reading and hearing about Monsanto around the world. And I know a lot of people are scared, and I think we should be scared in some ways. But I... I really believe more and more that we need to put all of our energy toward the positive. I just got another one of those uh, email alerts saying that we need to raise $25,000 by midnight to fight Monsanto again. And uh, frankly, I'm just not going to fight. I wish we had the $55 million that we spent on initiatives in the United States to label GMO foods. Can you imagine a million dollars funding seed schools? in all 50 states and what the impact of that would be in just a few years, we wouldn't need Monsanto. They wouldn't get any votes. And so that's what I'm um, at work doing, and I'd really love to see us turn this around. And so I'm looking forward. I'm looking to a beautiful new day. Um, We're seeing the explosion of an incredible local food movement, and now we need to attach that to a local seed movement. As Don Tipping from Siskiyou's Seeds told me over the weekend, he said, Bill, seeds are 10 times more important than local food because if we build a whole local food system and we don't have our seeds, we're just building a castle on the sand. And I I really and truly believe that. So that's the focus of tonight is to get you to help all of us connect our local food system to local seeds. I mean, here's a picture of a whole foods market. In New York, a new one, if I met um, Raj, who has uh, started Gotham Greens. Those are greenhouses on the top of the local foods that are growing the greens that are sold in the store. We're not talking food miles, folks, anymore. We're talking food steps. i also been reading lately about recycled containers you can buy now um, that have farms inside which is incredible, but if I ask um, Gotham Greens, which is now selling, I don't know, millions of dollars worth of fresh greens that's, are, that's all grown on rooftops in the New York metropolitan area, virtually all of those seeds come from somewhere else. 
and many of them come from Europe. Those are not our seats, and they're, a lot of them are hybrid, and now a lot of them come with patents on them. We don't, we, you can't even save your own seats if you wanted to. And so this is just an example of why we need to start asking questions about seed saving, and we'll know how to ask those questions if we start doing it ourselves. So I've been in and around um, seeds and in some senses teaching now since 1979. I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning about six years ago and said to myself, seed school, we just got to start teaching this, this stuff. And now I'm proud to announce we've had over 800 graduates from our programs. 17 seed companies have been started, and I'm just happy that I'm able, finally, you know, 800 students, probably 40 programs have been distilled. All their feedback, all that we've learned doing this in the last six years has been distilled down into this, our um, Seed School Online program. My own personal goal now is a million new seed savers. I think that our nation um, uh, can do that. There's over 8 million gardens every year planted in this country. Um, it's something that everybody did. There were millions of seed savers um, just two generations ago, so we know it can be done. I was in modern Russia where everybody was still saving seeds. And I have Carol Depe to help with this. She taught genetics at Harvard for 25 years and then wrote that wonderful book, Breed Your Own Vegetable Varieties, in the upper left. And then her direct quote is, until recently, all gardeners and farmers saved their own seed. And amateur plant breeding was the only kind of plant breeding there is. And so my goal tonight is to help you get up and running so you can be part of that. So who's this for? Of course it's for farmers. Almost, uh, if you go to, go to your local farmer's market and ask them where they get their seeds, I think this same thing will happen to you that has happened to me. 98% of the time, you'll find out that they come from mail order companies thousands of miles away. And so, we, again, if we're going to make our food system truly resilient and taste better and conform to our likes, then we're going to have to save our seeds. So farmers have a lot to learn about saving their own seeds. And, of course, home gardeners and families, you can reduce the cost that go into your gardens um, for one thing, just by saving seeds. You could, it's possible maybe from two tomatoes, you can get enough seeds to grow tomatoes in a small backyard for the rest of your life. This is a tremendously productive um, program. And uh, I think this is the target. This is where the million gardeners are going to come from. This is a picture of the sous chef. This is a Native American who's all the rage. This was in last week's New York Times. Um, indigenous food. It's not just local food now, it's indigenous food. Food that differentiates him in his marketplace. You have to go to his restaurant because he has varieties and things from the seeds that he's gotten from his elder and is growing now and saving himself that nobody else has. Wow, that I often thought that could be the driver in our economic system. Of course, students and teachers, we've had um, professors come to our seed schools. I love it when we are uh, able to go out and teach children. They get it. First graders love to learn about seeds. And activists, as I was saying earlier, you know, we can fight all we want against the world's largest corporations, or we can now build a world where they're unnecessary. And so um, this webinar is for you. And the preppers, we love the preppers. I lived in Tucson. Um, we uh, used to have a couple of big shows every year. I mean, I was a Boy Scout. I was an Eagle Scout. Actually, you know, the motto was be prepared. I don't think there's anything wrong with being prepared. Now, I'll admit, some of, these, some of my prepper friends go a little bit overboard, and they think they can do it themselves, totally themselves. And I've always believed that it's going to take a community of us to do it. But nevertheless, learning about seeds um, is really, really important, especially if you're a prepper. And community leaders. Um, this was one of our first seed schools in the middle there with the little uh, gray beard. It's Toby Hemingway, the great permaculture author who did Gaia's Garden. Just to his left there a little bit holding the bucket is Gary Nabin, Dr. Gary Nabin, who founded 
Native Seed Search and is the author of 30 books, um, including Coming Home to Eat and Where Our Food Comes From, um, and is a great seed saver. And so, you know, and this is this just happened um, a couple of years ago. There's a community leader, and this is at Seed Savers Exchange in Decorah, Iowa, the largest grassroots seed saving organization and nonprofit organization in in the world now. And so, uh, maybe there's something for all the leaders to learn. So, <clears throat> this is what we're going to cover more specifically tonight. What are the real problems that seed savers face? I mean, how did we get into this situation where you walk into a farmer's market and nobody's saving seeds? When you ask many, you know, even good American gardeners, and I've done this, and they say, oh, everybody knows you can't save your own seeds. I mean, they're hybrids or whatever, and you just have to buy them every year, you know? The second thing we're going to, I'm going to go through exact instructions with pictures, get you up and running on seed saving. It's easy to do. You can learn tonight. And then I'm going to kind of give you an overview of how to be a great seed saver. This is the hacking part. I'm finally hacking this whole um, topic to try to get people up and running quickly. And then there's three simple things that you can do. You're going to have to do this because if you get involved in seed saving, you're going to have more seeds than you can handle. And that means you're going to have to get involved in your community. And that number four is about how to do that. So. Sandra Katz, in his great book about ferment, fermenting foods, talks about a cult of expertise. Many people don't get into fermented foods because you, they think you have to have a Ph.D. in biochemistry to understand the germs that might harm you. And it's best to leave our food preparation and sterility to experts. Well, the same thing applies for us seed savers. We've developed this um, cult, almost, worship, around biotech industry um, and university and big company development of our seeds. And I want to break through that a little bit. Let's hack through that just a little bit. I think most of those misunderstandings are the result of a misunderstanding of scale. Okay, so bear with me a bit. I'm going to try to teach you something that I think is really profound as far as how we're going to have to change our lives and go forward, not just with seed saving, but with our entire agricultural system. One of the things we know is that the larger you make a farm or an agricultural interest or a seed company, the more profitable it becomes for the owners. Okay? The bigger it is, the more profitable it becomes. And what we've learned since maybe Earth Day, since I've been around long enough to have been there for that, We've learned to question that, unquestioned growth. And what we've learned is that the smaller we make our farms and our gardens, even down to a pot, the more ecological they can become. It's easier to do organic gardening. You can see how it interfaces with your environment around you. Okay, so that's a reality that we have to live with. We're waking up in the 21st century. Um, I personally don't believe our current industrial large-scale agriculture, monopoly agriculture, is sustainable. So we need to make it smaller, to make it sustainable. What size? I don't think we know yet. Certainly all the small people and the urban farmers, bless them, can't feed us all yet. So we're all going to have to decide. But we do need to move smaller. And this misunderstanding of scale is translated over to seeds. Seed-saving rules for large-scale agriculture are often applied to small farms and home gardens and home gardeners, okay? And so the same thing applies, you know? You need uniformity. You need um, large-scale breeding operations probably to increase yield to get seeds good enough for industrial agriculture. But the smaller the scale of your agriculture, the easier the seed saving instructions can be. You can make mistakes. In fact, that's where all the mistakes have always been made. That's how we got most of the diversity that mankind experiences in its food supply now. It was from small people over the millennia that didn't really know what they were doing, that had no idea what Gregor Mendel was talking about, and were not breeding necessarily for the uniformity of big systems. But we're just wanted to eat and liked what they found and saved those seeds. 
So larger your agriculture gets, the more profitable it gets, the smaller it gets, the more sustainable. The larger your seed system um, needs to be, the more uniform and the more rules and the more complicated the seed saving needs to be, the smaller your garden and the smaller your operation, the easier it gets to learn how to save those seeds because you can make more mistakes and enjoy the diversity that comes about. And as Carol, Dr. Carol Depe says, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? If you make a mistake in your own backyard saving seeds, something gets crossed up, something doesn't work genetically, what's the worst thing that can happen? You get to eat it. You're still gardening. If that happened to a large-scale farmer, they could lose their crop and be out of business. So you can see what I'm talking about, I think. So beginning seed savers, because this misunderstanding of scale, um, our society automatically thinks that if you save seeds, you have to do it at industrial scale with that kind of uniformity and rules. And so when you open up even seed saving manuals for home gardeners, you get complicated manuals. This is from seed to seed. And the first page, it's in Latin. What does that mean? You know? And there's all these myths that come about. You can't save seed from hybrids. Well, an industrial farmer never would because there would be so much diversity in that next generation, it would render the uniformity that he needs um, useless. But we can do that, and I'll talk about that later. Seed saving is too difficult. Over and over, gardeners tell me this. And yet, remember what Carol Depe said? Everybody used to save seeds. Every farmer and gardener for almost all of human history. This is not too difficult to do. This is what gardening is and how to do it better. And seed saving is not worth my time. I'm just too busy. You know, I'm lucky to garden anyway. Seed saving doesn't have to take any more time. It takes a little organization and a little enlightened knowledge, but most of the great seed savers I know um, don't even um, count up the time they spent on the seed saving. The hard part is actually the gardening. And then, of course, there's that insecurity. Oh, well, you know, these guys are spending $150 million to develop these new varieties. They've got to be better than mine. Mine will never be as good as the stuff I can buy off this. They're in such pretty packets, too. Well, I'm just telling you, in my own experience, that is not necessarily true. It's not even true at an industrial level, is what John Navazio would say, is that, you know, we're spending 75 times as much on the biotech industry. That's our government. Um, for research as we do on public plant breeding, the old-fashioned way. So no wonder they're better, or at least perceived to be better. But they're not really. Not I don't believe that um, any of the things that have been done uh, for agriculture would have been prevented from being done the old-fashioned way had we put the time and energy and attention into doing that. And this is my favorite. Oh, I might make a mistake. Things may get crossed up. A pump zini, anybody? A pumpkin and a z zucchini crosses because I'm saving seeds and I don't know what I'm doing. Wow. I love pump zinis. They taste great. In fact, that kind of backyard mistake is what's responsible for one of the world's great open pollinated winter squashes, Waltham butternut. This wasn't developed in a multi-million dollar breeding program. This came out of the backyard of a part-time insurance salesman in Pennsylvania in the 50s. If we didn't have backyard gardeners trying to save seeds and make a mistake, we wouldn't get stuff like this. So I'm hoping tonight to get you set on that adventure. So I got started, as I was saying, trying to find seeds for my own garden. And this was at the University of Montana in 1979. We ended up finding some things that were disappearing. Most of the diversity in our agriculture has disappeared. It was disappearing then. All the stuff adapted to Montana. We found enough of it to start a little seed company called Garden City Seeds. Um, that was later sold to Irish Eyes, but it's still going. And you can still see some of the descriptions and stories that we wrote way back in the 70s. Later, I moved home to Ketchum, Idaho, where I grew up, started High Altitude Gardens, which I ran for 28 years, trying to find seeds um, from around the world that were adapted to cold climates. I was at 6,000 feet, not even a 90-day growing season, and saving, learning how to save seeds there and adapt them to that cold, high climate. Probably I, that was most famous for a trip to Siberia I took. 
brought back 60 varieties of Siberian tomatoes, 24 of which I think are still in circulation in tea companies around the world. Things like Sasha's Altai and Galena are very popular. That's Gregory from Gregory's Altai on the screen. And so I just want to reiterate how important and exciting and maybe even lucrative this is. 17 of the students of our seed schools now have gone on to start their own small bioregional seed companies. Our seed system's gotten so centralized and so monopolized that it's opened up the market everywhere for small companies to actually do the real work again the way it was done two generations ago when we had a seed source in each valley, practically. And so here's a picture of Matthew and Astrid from the Living Seed Company. They were students of ours in one of our first seed companies, and I invite you to go there. Or you can go to seedsafe.org under our resources. We have a list of the 17 companies, and you can explore what's going on in that world. So join us. All right, let's just learn how to save some seeds. That's all you really need to do. Do you realize that all you need is a handful of seeds and access to the web, put them in a few packets, and you can have a small seed company. You can sell them on eBay. You can sell them on Amazon. Last time I checked, there's like 130,000 entries for packets of seeds from all over the world on eBay. So let's learn how to do this. You want to start with the selfers. This is hack number one number two tonight. Hack number one was just learning that scale problem. Hack number two is start with the cell first. If you want to make seed saving easy, do it at a small scale first so you can make mistakes. You take all the pressure off. And number two, start with the self-pollinating flowers. These are pollen. These are, um, these are vegetables that have per what we call perfect flowers. That means they have both the male and female parts in the same flower and they pollinate themselves. Many times you put the flower even open, and that's a tomato flower, and in that cone sticking out to the right you are the anthers are on the inside of that, and the stigma style, the, the female portion is on the inside, and it'll try to stick itself out through the end of that cone, but in order to do so, it has to drag itself by its own pollen. So it self-pollinates. Now, the reason we're starting with self-pollinating flowers tonight is that you don't have to worry about cross-pollination. You can grow them in your own yard. You don't have to worry about your neighbors. You don't have to worry about separating. Now, cross-pollination can take place. And in some areas of the country, it takes place more um, than in other areas. There are leaf-cutter bees in some areas that drill through these things. But by and large and generally, you can get started as a beginner and save seeds from your favorite tomato, your favorite pepper, your favorite bean, pea, or lettuce. Those are the vegetables we'll talk about. And be assured, most of the time, you'll get a representation of the same variety that you grew in the first place. You don't have to worry about Mr. Toad's wild ride and getting something you didn't expect. All right? So tomatoes, easy. Cut them at the equator. Put the stem up, cut them, and the bottom would be Antarctica. Cut them at the equator. Open up the cavities so you can see them. They'll look like this, and you can see the little seeds in their jelly goop. All right? And then you want to squeeze those seeds out into jars. And if you're doing a bunch, like you can see in the picture there, you'll get jars full. That'll be enough. If you don't put a little bit of water in it, because you're going to have to let that jar um, uh, sit in a warm place out of the sun for two to five days until you start to see the white mold on the top. It always forms. That's bread mold. Inside a yeast is forming that's actually eating that jelly off the seeds. And so, voila, you can see the good seeds fall to the bottom of the jar. The, the seeds that are immature are bad ones, and all the other phlegmy stuff will float to the top. And this is what you'll look like if you'll stir it, maybe once a day for two to five days, all right? These are ready to clean. Then you water winnow them. Um, by filling that jar completely full of water and then pouring out all the stuff that is not seeds, and you'll see the seeds in the bottom. Let them settle to the bottom, pour it out, and then fill it up again and pour all the stuff out except for the seeds and fill it up again. By the third time, it should start to look like that picture in the bottom left. You'll just have mostly clean seeds in the bottom of your jar. You tip that over on a screen or a sieve, and you get these little tomato cookies, I like to call them, 
You can flip that over on a paper towel or a paper plate. Be sure you label it. When you get to be my age, you have to put the date on it and the year because these things go fast. In two or three days, out of the sun and in a dry place, these things will dry up and you have got your tomato seed. Doing our own seeds this way at high altitude gardens, we got 90% germination after 10 years. These things are incredibly durable and easy to store. Peppers. You can just rip open a pear, pepper and get the seed out. How easy is that? You can still eat the pepper. You could have eaten the tomato after you squeeze the tomato seeds out. If you will take the seeds when they look like this, um, they're still viable. You won't get as many that are viable. The best thing to do is let it dry completely if you can and get the seeds out. And then the seeds will be better. They have that, what um, Steve Peters from Seed Revolution Now calls that beautiful golden pepper seed color. That's what the best pepper seeds look like. And that's what you're looking for. Easy to save pepper seeds. Oh, let's save some bean seeds. How hard is that? There's a bean that's starting to dry. You want to wait till they get to the end, till they get that buckskin color, and they start to break open. When they do that, just start gathering them. If you live in a cold climate and you uh, and your season's going to end before they dry, pull the whole plant. Shake the dirt off the roots. Bring them inside. Hang them upside down and let them finish drying. And that way you can even get beans in really short climates. Here's a nice picture of the beans that are drying in a in a, a shade room uh, until they're all ready. They're over a tarp, so if any of them start to crack open, the seeds fall out, you can gather everything up. Um, sometimes if you get real hard pods or they're not all quite dry, you can uh, dance on them somewhat. And we used to do that. That's a picture at Native Seed Search when I was the director there. Evan Sofro is there in the middle. His rule was no threshing beans without bluegrass music. Peas, same thing. Even purple peas or whatever, let them dry out as much as you can. You can see the fully formed peas on the inside. The peas are the seeds. We had people walk into our store at Native Seed Search um, with bags. They would get uh, pounds of beans to cook, you know, from the food section of our store. And then they come up to the counter and ask where they could buy the seeds for those beans. <laughs> you just have to giggle because the beans are the seeds, you know. You can use the beans as your seeds. There's peas, and there's wrinkled sides, there's round ones. You can learn a lot about this process just doing them. There's a nice picture of pea seeds just getting ready to harvest. Peas, you can't eat the peas and save the seeds. They're unlike the tomatoes and peppers. Lettuce, one of the great sulfurs, you know, all lettuce bolts and goes to seed, as we call it in uh, most gardens, especially in the arid west where we are, where it starts to get hot in July and August. And that's a you know, a real bummer. I'll use a word from the 60s because you can't eat it anymore. The, it starts to get bitter. But now you can celebrate because it sends up yellow flowers that then turn into these seed heads. All right, so here's what it looks like up close. There's little 10 packs of these black seeds that come off the lettuce. There's a greenhouse waiting for uh, lettuce seed. Greenhouses are nice for this because the wind can't come in and blow them all off. That way they're all just getting ready for you to harvest. And so how easy is that? So when you're growing lettuce and they start to bolt, pull the first few. What you, you, you don't want to save seeds from the first lettuce plant that bolt or go to seed in your garden because that's what you're be selecting for. So wait till one of the last ones actually goes to seed and save the seeds from that. And that way you'll actually be lengthening the season that your lettuce will be edible in your own garden. Wow. You're already a seed saver. I highly recommend that you start with selfers like this. Uh, we're, we, you do not have to save seeds from everything to help us save the world. If you'll just pick your own favorite vegetable and learn to do it well and then go on to the next one and share those seeds with your friends around you and they say they're saving something different, whole communities can be taken care of in relatively short order. Okay, uh, now what I want to do is kind of give you some overview a little bit about how to be a great seed saver. What I'm doing is pretending like I'm never going to be able to talk to you again, 
and you're never going to get any more information. And the world needs a million new seed savers. So I'm depending on you guys to pay attention to this and absorb this stuff and go on and be great seed savers, okay? So overall, seed saving is a tension for you, for me, between natural selection and carefully managed variety maintenance. Okay, so I'm going to explain this. Every time a plant grows, there are innumerable forces acting on it, uh, forces that we don't even understand. It is, in a sense, intelligently learning to interact and adapt to its local environment, wherever it is. So if you grow the same tomato in Florida and you grow it in uh, Missoula, Montana, different things are happening to that plant even during that year. And this isn't woo-woo. This isn't hocus-pocus stuff. Although sometimes I don't think it's explained well enough by scientists. But here is a quote out of the principles of plant breeding. If you were to go to college tomorrow and you wanted to study biotech and you had to get your undergrad in plant breeding in order to go on, you would get this textbook. And in it would be this quote. Natural selection may be more discerning than farmers or plant breeders in identifying and preserving adaptively superior traits. This is happening to every plant you grow every time you grow one. And the rest of this quote is, natural selection in itself is often successful in altering adaptively superior traits, traits that are often difficult for breeders to identify and quantify. That includes you, Monsanto. When I grow something in my own backyard, I may be able to identify, my plant may be identifying things, uh, adaptively superior traits that you'll never even be able to see and probably won't have the money to. This is Greg Peterson, who's hosted this um, whole Urban Farm uh, webinar series, Urban Farm U. He told me a story about his own basil in his own backyard that just reseeded itself in Phoenix, Arizona, and came back year after year. What I think we'll talk at the end of the show, through every three or four years now. And what I pointed out to him is that he is a great seed saver. By just letting his basil go to seed, and the seeds from that made it from his plant that year have selected themselves and fallen into that environment and grown year after year and have started to change themselves. I call this the reluctant, absent-minded seed-saving um, method. And this is, it does, seed-saving does not have to take time, folks. It just has to be recognized this powerful um, uh, thing that happens with natural selection. So let's look at the other side of it then, modern plant breeding. Let's break that down really quickly so it doesn't scare you anymore. So you can understand when you hear about modern plant breeding projects, even biotech, you'll understand what they're trying to do. It basically equals plant improvement. Okay, that's all modern plant breeding is, is we want to improve plants. And when we say we want to improve them, Prove them. Over 10,000 years, humans have been doing some pretty simple things. We try to make them bigger. We try to make things easier to harvest. We try to make things so they have more starch and sugar because we like that. And we try to breed out bitters, which were probably in there for insect repellent, but we don't like the way they taste. And that pretty much sums up most efforts around plant breeding. I know I'm generalizing, but the millions of hours and dollars that have been put in to doing those things sum up modern plant breeding. And when you talk about plant breeding, clear up until the biotech era, plant improvement meant one thing, control of pollen. We want to improve the plant by improving the genetics in it. But in order to do that, we have to control the sexual reproduction, the pollen that brings new genes into that plant. So plant improvement is simply control of pollen. And the best and the easiest way to do that is by isolation. Plant the kinds of plants either together or apart from each other as you need to in order to control the outcome genetically that you're looking for. And in this way, urban farmers are way ahead. Most of us automatically think we've got to big, big farmers and be industrial people, you know, to be great plant breeders. Actually, buildings help us isolate more easily. Whole neighborhoods 
could work on projects more quickly because they've got trees, bushes, and buildings um, keeping um, pollen from contaminating their projects, all right? Another way to control pollen, and this is a picture from Native Seed Search, you can do pollen cages. You can make your own out of hoops and frost cloth. Um, but controlling pollen becomes really important if you want to improve things on a larger scale, make them more uniform, maybe make them better for your local farmer's market. And then last but not least of the techniques is hand pollination. And there's huge complications and practice that come with hand pollination. The great seed craft in the crafters that know how to hand pollinate only get proficient from practice. And so as you get better as a seed saver, start like Greg Peterson, reluctant, absent-minded, forgot to harvest his basil, went to seed on its own, keeps reseeding itself. That's where we all start. But as we work up and want to control things more and more, um, it's endless. You can spend your whole life learning how to be a better uh, plant breeder, a better person around improving your crops, all right? So remember, all of our food came originally from wild plants. All the plant food that we eat came originally from wild plants, all right? And mankind, farmers have been doing this for more than 10,000 years, maybe 12,000 years. Most of this was done before Gregor Mendel and uh, his work was rediscovered and actually brought to the world in 1903. So nobody knew what genetics were. Um, plant improvement was done by saving the seeds from the things that those farmers thought would work best for them. And this is, if, if you uh, are just writing down major notes for the evening, I want you to remember what it says on the screen right now. Because this demystifies most of the political and economic pressure that I read about in the news daily to get us to buy in to biotech and our industrial food system. They say they need to spend millions of dollars and, and genetically alter crops in order for us to feed 9 billion people. And if you understand what I've been talking about, um, the diversity, the resilience, that we're going to need for sustainability, especially in the face of climate change, will only come through a grassroots movement. This is a biological certainty. The more people we get saving seeds, the more diversity, the more adaptation, the more resilient we will create, period. Okay? It is fitting and proper for the whole focus of humanity on seeds to move to grassroots, to us, to the small people. We can learn how to take the things that we make mistakes of and create and adapt where we are and make them more uniform for our farmers at a larger scale um, agriculture when we figure out what level that is to feed ourselves. But until then, the rush is on. We need everybody to save some of their own seeds so that we can recreate diversity. And to do that, it's simple, selection. Selection is the most powerful breeding, plant breeding technique we have. That's a quote from Carol Depe, 25 years teaching genetics at Harvard. I'm not making this up. So we want to, um, modern plant breeding is improving crops. Improving crops is isolating or taking, uh, making sure that we control the pollen. And of all those breeding techniques, the most powerful one and the one that we've used the most is selection. And so there's an example of a wild plant, Brassica oleraceae, is a common wild mustard. And depending where it was and which country and who liked it and what they wanted it for, over the past several hundred years is all it took. Look at what we've selected out just by selecting. Next time you walk out into your own garden and you see things growing there, don't just look at what's there. Look at it the way you do it at this picture here. What can you turn it into? All right? So selection. This is a picture of a stocky red rooster sweet pepper that Rowan White from the Sierra Seed Co-op um, got from Frank Morton. When she grew it out, um, many of the papers, peppers were misshapen. They weren't as beautiful. They, weren't, they didn't look like stocky red roosters should. 
this is that tension between natural adaption and modern plant breeding to maintain a variety that I started talking about. So Rowan, she sells seeds. She wanted to maintain the variety. So she only saved seeds from the ones on the right side of those shears. That's selection. This is what you and I can do when we walk out into our yards as beginning seed savers and start to make a tremendous difference. Uh, Rowan also got a striped Roman tomato in her garden. And one time, one of the plants with same striped Roman tomato, but something was wrong. Something was different. It was lemon. It was yellow. It wasn't striped. It was a sport or a mutation or hidden recessives that hadn't expressed themselves, as a geneticist would say, for a long time. And so Rowan saved the seeds from those. She selected those and created a whole new variety. You can do this in your own backyard without knowing anything else except for selecting what you like. This is a picture of pepper trials at UC Davis when they got wiped out by one of the most notorious pepper diseases. By any stretch of the imagination, that picture looks like a disaster. And yet, John Navazio, the great plant breeder who's working for Johnny Selected Seeds, um, would say, this is a gold mine. Every time you see a disaster disease-wise in your garden from now on, I want you to look for the success. And the success is selecting and saving seeds from the peppers that made it, that have a natural immunity to the problem that you're seeing. I just had a wonderful farmer in southern Idaho, Nate Jones, come to me and say he was going up. 150-foot row of zucchini. They just got a, a powdery mildew on them. It's wiped out all the plants in the row. So there's no more zucchini at the farmer's market. That's where I saw them. Except two plants made it out of the whole row. Bingo. He's going to mark them with red survey tape, and we're going to let them grow to seed. They'll get big and orange and plump. He's going to save the seeds from those zucchini and plant them against next year so he won't have the same problem. This is selection. This is what you can do to be a great seed saver. And the last thing I'll see, to, uh, talk to you about is demystifying one of the great myths in our modern seed saving world, at least in America, and that is that you can't save seeds from hybrids. And what I would say is why not? You will not get exactly what the, pep, the parent was. I mean, any more than a, a blonde mother and a black-haired father, when they have a red-haired child, right, something fishy is going on. It's the same thing happening in hybrids. There were hidden recessive genes that were expressed from both the mother and the father that allowed their child to have red hair. But will that child have children that have red hair? Maybe. Maybe not. It's more complicated than that. And so if you save seeds from a hybrid, it's just simply more complicated. But remember what I said, um, the quote from Carol Depe, the worst thing that can happen is you still get to eat it. And some of the offspring, the F2s, filial one is what we call our first generation after a hybrid cross. That's what a modern hybrid is. F2 generation are the seeds you save from your hybrid. If you save those seeds and plant them, you're just going to get some diversity. And if you want to accelerate your plant breeding adventure, plant a lot of them. That F2 generation is where you want to plant a lot of these. And see all the diversity expressed. And then when you find some that look like your gypsy peppers, say in this instance, save the seeds from those. And when you plant them again and save the seeds in the F3s, more of them will look like your gypsies. F4s, even more. Usually, for most home gardeners, you can get a working population in three to four generations. Wow, we have unlocked the key. There have been millions of dollars of improvement in our plant world in the last 20, 30, 40 years, making new hybrids that are disease resistant, that have all sorts of colors and traits that are actually really fun to play with. And now we can have access to them. By dehybridizing, you don't have to buy your seeds every year. If you're uh, if you're growing hybrids, you can save your own seeds. What is a hybrid? 
Well, a hybrid is a modern term. The, the modern term of hybrid means that two genetically inbred parents, parents that have been worked on by a plant breeder, these aren't ones just out in the field naturally naturally adapting. These are ones that have been inbred, and and then they are crossed, okay, um, in a controlled experiment. And the offspring that grows up, um, has seeds that are then sold as F1 hybrids, okay? And so, um, for example, um, uh, the first vegetable to really be hybridized was corn. And corn breeders were looking for strong stalks, and they were looking for corn that had really big ears. And it turns out all the genetic material they find that had found that had really strong stalks so the corn wouldn't blow over, all of those had really puny ears. And the ones that had big ears had really flimsy stalks. And so what they did was inbreed that corn for a few generations. So they were they got a really clear idea. And we go into this in seed school and in seed school online. We'll have pictures. We do an intro to Mendelian genetics so you can understand this better. So if you don't tonight, just let go of it a little bit. But simply what they do is cross those two corns together and grow up some corn and save those seeds. And they would sell those seeds as hybrid corn seeds because when you plant those, the trait of having the strong stalks and having the big ears would be in that first generation. What are you going to do? You're going to save your own seeds. If you do nothing else, save something. If you've got a trailer with one pot on the deck, Save your own seeds. I had a gentleman who saved seeds on the side of the Transamerica building in San Francisco. He was selecting our Siberian tomato seeds for the best tomato for the side of the Transamerica building in the coldest place there is in the summer in the United States, you know. I mean, it doesn't matter where you are, and you will start to change the world. Switches will come on in you. You will understand things differently. You will vote differently. You will buy your food differently. Your grandchildren will see what you're doing and be affected. This is the 10,000-year-old ritual, folks, that made all civilization possible. We don't start saving seeds, and we're still hunter-gatherers. And We have no villages, no towns, no cities, and no webinars if we don't save seeds. And so, as I said, we need the diversity right now. We, and the only way to get it is if we all do it, come back and do it. That's Joseph Lofthaus, one of our great seed spirits, one of the most happy and brilliant home garden seed breeders I've ever met. And that's Lee from Hopi. He's the head of the Cultural Commission for the Hopi and seed keeper for Second Mesa. Um, Lee told me he doesn't know who he is. In fact, the Hopi do not know how to be Hopi without saving the seeds of their corn. And those seeds are their children. They have deep identity around seed saving. We have a lot to learn from them. Um, start a seed exchange. If you save some seeds, you're going to have too many. And go to a seed exchange. And if, you know, if there's one locally, there's hundreds of them now. But if you don't have one, start one. And my favorite, have potluck dinner. So everybody sticks around. They have to make some of their own local food, and they have to bring some of their own seeds that they've saved. And in that way, a, a community or a village or even part of a city can self-organize itself, find out who is doing the best thing around each of the vegetables you all want or need. And you can all trade them at the seed exchange, and everybody gets their seeds and the stories about how to grow them on their way home in one quick little thing. In fact, CD Saturdays have become an institution in Canada. Google this up and see how many there are now. There are hundreds of them. It's become part of a national pastime in Canada now. And now there's CD Sundays. Sometimes cities have more than one a year um, because they become so popular. I mean, what would it be like to come in and have all these people with all their seeds and all their stories? And if something didn't work, they can tell you that. Or if you need to do something special, this is a very efficient and incredible way for us to exchange our information about seeds. This is a picture of Dr. Gary Nabba from the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, Sunday Times, food section, uh, which celebrated Tucson, Arizona, and their seed library. They've got nine branches in the Pima County Library System hooked up with interlibrary loan for seeds. 
And in the last four and a half years, we figure an estimated 500 seed libraries have sprung up around the world. This is our answer to the centralization of the seed industry. We are going to do it ourselves. 400 seed libraries in the United States alone. My good friends at the Cleveland Seed Bank, these are superstar people if you want to get involved. They're basically a seed library. They call it the Cleveland Seed Bank or the Toronto Seed Library. Those guys are on fire. They have nine seed libraries in Toronto alone. Um, in libraries, when I asked them how they did it, they said, oh, Bill, there was a library convention of all the librarians for this part of Canada coming together in Toronto. So we just went down and set up a booth, and we got them all in one place, and they all said, great idea, and went back and started seed libraries. I mean, this is the fun stuff that's starting to move this, this thing. Hundreds of our students from seed schools have started seed libraries. And if you really want to then provide a bit more um, overview and security for your region, then start a seed bank. This is the Archinoa Seed Bank in uh, Greece, Politi, they call it. They call it a living seed bank because it actually doesn't even have a place yet. They take care of more accessions, they call them, more different varieties, the seeds to them, than the National Seed Bank in Greece does now. He just passed. They have 8,000 members that come together for a big music and seed festival once a year. And they've got a database. And everybody brings the seeds that they've saved and grown successfully and brings them back to the festival. And they're all entered into a database and then they're all divided up and taken back out at the end of the festival and taken care of. And so everybody knows where everything is, but they don't have it in one place. What we're doing, we're going to do a version of that in the Rocky Mountain West here at the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, which I'm uh, really proud to be a part of. We've got drawings and we're underway to build our region's first grassroots community-funded seed ball. And this will just be for safety backup. You know, the times come, how many times in the last six months have you read about a thousand-year flood? You know, some of them are 20 miles wide. 200 miles long in Virginia and Maryland and in Louisiana, taking out whole valleys. What if that's your seed library? What if that's all the people in your seed exchange and you all lose all your seed? It's time for safety backup. So that's what we're going to do. All our best seed stewards need it. I need it. Everyone we know needs a little safety backup. So this is going to be partially underground. It's going to be an educational place. You can walk in front of it and look in the glass. There will be light switches that will show some of the seeds that are in. The concrete out in front will tell the stories of the seeds that have come from this region. We just found Hope Johnson's garlic that came in a covered wagon into the Chalice Valley, you know, in 1903 or something, more than 100 years ago. Wow. You know, we got to back that stuff up. So. Wow. Wow, that was a lot of information. Can you just kind of tie it in a bow for us? <laughs> wow. This is the most important, most impassioned, most fun, and if you want it to be, most lucrative thing you could do as a human being on planet Earth in the early 20th century. I really believe this. Mm -hmm. Every other thing I've ever been involved with, every system, breaks down, needs more money, is mm -hmm. worth less. But when I plant a handful of seeds, that can turn, like we did, we planted several handfuls of white sonoran wheat at Native Seed Church when I was director down there. And before I left, we had 1,100 acres. What else can you do that can bring about that kind of abundance? So, oh, yeah. Anyway, that, that's what we're, it's easy. Don't get, you know, don't get mystified by the mythology around this. Most of those things were industrial creatures. We've been in this industrial storm. We've been taught to look at things in a certain way. And, folks, it just ain't true. Seed saving is your natural birthright, and you know how to do it, even though you don't think you do. Yeah. So that's a that's, wow. uh, seed saving hack. Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that.